looks like we are now. Uh, are we? Let's see what happened to my webcam there. USB camera. Sorry if everyone can hear me on here. My camera's having some issues. It shows my camera's stuck at the top corner. Let me uh, see if I can figure this out, and then we'll get started on the video. Uh, thanks for everybody for joining. Uh, once you can see my face moving. I have one person in class today uh, here at the store. Uh, my name is Saxon. I'll be teaching you guys on camera basics today. So real easy stuff. If you're new to taking photos, if you've just gotten a camera, or you need a refresher on how to use this guy. Um, we're going to be talking about everything that you need to point the camera forward, take a clean shot, mainly in the automatic setting. We might talk about some of the modes and the dials a little bit today, um, but our main concern is taking a clean and crisp photo in that automatic setting. Um, so let me get a couple minutes here, we'll let other people join. I'm going to get this camera to start going, uh, and then we'll start going from there, guys. So a few more minutes and then we'll get started. That's going. Uh, I'm gonna figure out what's wrong with this camera. Let's see. Maybe I can switch. go okay looks like I got it can everybody hear me if you can't hear me just uh, let me know and uh, we'll go from there my camera seems to have a little bit of lag or latency to it but I think we should be okay Let's get into it. Uh, perfect. Thank you, Susan, for confirming. I just wanted to make sure you guys could hear me. All right. Welcome to Camera Basics. So let's get started on it. Uh, thanks for showing up. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for everybody online for tuning in. So we'll jump right into it. So for Camera Basics, the first thing I like to talk about with everybody is where do you go when all else fails? I'm glad that you showed up to class today. Glad you're online. But it's important that we remember that there's a lot of resources out there for cameras. Uh, especially nowadays too, there are so many different cameras that we have available, there's so many different ways to shoot, there really is no excuse um, for anybody out there who you know can't familiarize themselves with the camera. There are so many different ways to do it. First thing I always recommend is start by reading the owner's manual. A lot of it is small print, it's very tiny text. It's hard to get through at times, it feels mumbo jumbo y, but it does have a lot of the information, if not all of the information, that you really need to know to understand this. Um, YouTube is my second one. I YouTube everything that I don't physically know. Um, if there is any question out there that you need answered, YouTube will have an answer for you with a video, and I think the video is worth a thousand words. Um, when you can physically show somebody in person how to do it or just in, in person, I feel like it makes the entire difference in the world versus reading. Uh, and then Masterclass has been one that I recommend to a lot of people. 
when the pandemic hit, a lot of professionals and people in the leading industry got into Masterclass. It is a service that you pay monthly for, um, but they have tons of different videos between cooking, photo making, uh, editing softwares, uh, music, uh, writing seminars. They have all this different stuff. So Masterclass is also a really great, useful resource. Looks like I have to toggle from the one screen there. Uh, so the next thing we'll talk about before we really get into the camera is where do your pictures go? What does that mean? Um, when you're taking photos, no camera that you purchase now, except for some action cameras like GoPros or DJI, have any type of internal storage. Uh, and when I say internal storage, I mean what is av what's available for you to save your physical photos to the camera. There's nothing inside the camera. You as a consumer, as a photographer, need to choose what kind of storage solution you want. Uh, there's all different types of brands. Samsung makes their own. SanDisk is very well known. Um, there's Adata, there's Sony, there's Lexar, Promaster. Uh, you've got tons of different brands out there. Um, really the most important thing to remember with this is what you're doing as a photographer. Are you taking a lot of videos? Are you shooting a lot of pictures? If you're on a video side of things, you probably want to get something higher than 64 gigabytes at a minimum. I would recommend doing something at 128 um, or higher. Um, if you're just taking primarily photos, I would say anything between 32 and up is a great way to start. Um, the megapixels on the camera and then the quality of what you're shooting in will dictate how much uh, storage gets taken up on the SD cards. Um, so if you're shooting in RAW versus JPEG, RAW eats up more of the file size than a JPEG image does on the camera. Um, but it, both are needed for different stuff. And we, we don't really talk about RAW too much in this class. It's more of an intermediate. Um, but it's important to keep that in mind when choosing an SD card. Primarily photo, 32 or higher, you'll be fine. If you're doing video, you should definitely do higher than 64. And if I really could push you, 128 should be a good minimum to start for video. And then read and write speed is important too, but that's something that we can talk about in the intermediate class. For the basics, it's not as important. Uh, now, I put this quote at the very beginning because I think that with cameras, uh, it's important to remember, the bitterness of poor quality remains long after the sweetness of a low price is forgotten. It is great when we can get a deal on things. It is awesome when we can save money. But I think for photography purposes, we have to remember the more money you put into your camera, the better your pictures are going to come out. Um, there's really no way around that. You can have the best expertise on taking a photo and you can know your camera left and right and upside down, take it apart, put it back together. Um, but if the camera only has a 16 megapixel sensor on there and you paid four or $500 for it, your iPhone's gonna take a better photo. Um, if you are you know, putting a lot of money into a camera, you're gonna get a really nice result. And then on top of that, learning how to use it, it's kind of the double threat combo where now you're an experienced photographer or an experienced with what product you own, uh, but you have a beautiful piece that takes extremely high quality images or videos. Going back into the pictures, um, pictures should not live on your memory card. So those memory cards that we talked about two slides ago, um, depending on what you're choosing, what you have, you should never leave your photos on the memory card as a whole. The memory card is meant to save the photo and provide a point A to point B kind of transaction for your photo. Point A is coming from the camera, point B then goes to your computer or your memory storage, storage or solution. Um, Memory cards are meant to be reused. Um, a lot of professional photographers will hold on to their SD cards and maybe keep the images on there. Hi, Hi there. Welcome in. Yeah, Saxon. Yeah, good to see you. You're Saxon? Yes, I am. You have a beard now. I do have a beard. It's hey, been a couple of weeks. Yeah, yeah, I met you a few weeks ago. I remember. We came yeah, in. Yeah, okay. we brought out the lens and Sorry, everything. No, no, you're fine. Welcome. You only missed like three slides, so you're literally okay. You're literally good. Take your time. Uh, that? Closest one, just go around the atrium there. It's kind of hidden behind all the furniture stuff. Okay. Just awesome. stay on this floor, go all the way around. You'll all see right. it. Thank you. Of course. Got two people now in the camera class today. We're doing good. Uh, but to go back into it, pictures should not live on your memory card. Take your photos, move your photos when you're done with them. 
if you are someone who um, isn't as worried or concerned about budget with your camera, I do like to have multiple sources of my photos living on items. So having my photos live on an SD card, on my computer, and then on an external hard drive, that's the way that I typically like to do it. And I probably have 60 SD cards at home. It's an absurd amount. Um, but that's how I do it for my safety of my work and my photos. Uh, don't lose your pictures or damage your card. There's a, it's, it's getting more and more increasingly hard to do this where um, people are rushing through and losing information on your SD card or on your computer and not being able to recover certain files or photos, but it does happen. Um, and there's ways to avoid that. Is it all foolproof? No, it's technology. Things can glitch, things can have errors. Um, but overall, if you take these practices when using your SD card inside your computer, you really should never lose any of your photos. So the first step to anything, you've taken a bunch of photos, you're ready to transfer, turn that camera off. Your camera should be completely off once you get ready to plug it in or remove the card into the computer. Um, and when I say plug in or remove the card, you have both options. I prefer an SD card reader. I think that the transfer is um, more coherent and is also more reliable than plugging in with your camera. If for any reason your camera glitches out while you're trying to transfer all your photos over, um, you can run into more problems there where the camera physically could um, malfunction the SD card and photos could be lost that way or videos could be lost that way too. Um, after you've waited about five seconds after turning off your camera, remove the card. Um, so I've got a Sony a7 III in front of me right now. If anybody who's new isn't familiar, in this slot, if I pull open this side, you'll see that I have two SD card slots in there. If I were to be taking a card out, I would just pop it out from here, throw it into an SD card reader, or on the opposite side of this camera, I have a multifunction port, and they actually give you two, micro USB and USB-C. Um, DSLRs, cameras I would say anywhere from 2020 or 19 or older you're gonna see micro USB with that uh, anything newer than that should be USB-C so you can plug in via cable uh, I recommend removing the physical card going through an SD card reader and then going from there um, SD card reader will plug somewhere into the computer either via USB-A or USB-C and then from there you'll throw your SD card in there um, don't use your camera to read cards or send pics back and forth. Again, it's not preferable. If that's the only means to method that you got, go for it. But it's one of those things that you could put yourself at a higher risk to lose those photos. Um, and then sending your pictures from your phone or from your camera to your phone. It's a nice option. It's a good thing to play with. But um, using that feature will do two things. One, it'll eat the battery life up like crazy on your phone and on your camera. Um, and then two, it's transferring the photo, but it's not necessarily transferring the photo at its highest resolution or at its highest quality. So if you're out and about, let's say you're in Colorado, you take some beautiful mountain pictures, now you really quickly either want to maybe text them to your buddy to show them where you're at, or you maybe want to throw it on Facebook. The new cameras, most cameras from, uh, I want to say like 2010 and up, are uh, Wi-Fi Bluetooth enabled and so you can connect to your phone and either do a remote transfer to your phone or you can do a um, what's the term like a remote control on the phone as well too where you can use the camera settings and control them via the phone great features awesome to use but they'll eat the battery life up on your camera and on your phone like crazy so the best thing to do with photos especially if you've got a hundred to transfer over pop that SD card out put it into your computer and follow those steps Moving from there, SD card readers, um, use a good one. There's multiple brands out there. We carry ProMaster. It's a great third-party company for accessories. You don't pay nearly as much as something like a Sony or some of the higher-end card readers. Um, but get a card reader that fits your needs. Some card readers will have a CF Express and a SD card on there. Uh, easiest way to think about that is higher-end cameras, um, things like the um, Nikon's, thinking of their final D series. I can't think of the name of it right now. That'll use CF Express. Um, things like the Sony Alpha 9, things like um, Canon's R5, and I believe their R6 too. They're all going to use the CF Express. It's a bigger SD card, better for um, raw videos, raw photos. Not all cameras can take it. It's important to know if yours do or don't. 
You can also get SD card readers with micro SD on there or with standard SD. Standard SD is what you're going to see in most cameras. So for my Sony here, uh, I know for your camera and for your camera too, you have the R5. R6. R6. So do you have an, uh, where are your SD cards are? They're right here inside. Pop it open. Do you have a big, big one in there? I do. So then you have a CF Express too. So that's a standard SD card and there's a second slot in there? Yeah. And that's the bigger one. Or the I same size. Pull, I pulled out the biggest one first, 256. And oh, okay. So you still have, so it's the R5 that goes into CF Express. You I just have CF Express on this one. That's the yeah. one that's the, that's the new format, right? Well, so Compact Flash has been around for a while. They've had different variations of it. The newer Compact Flash, CF Express Type B. Yeah, you just have the standard. Yeah. This is Alexar. And you're running at V60. So you're running at like minimal, minimal velocity. So that's like a good standard photo. Mm -hmm. um, CF Express is great for raw files, so you will get files if you're shooting as a professional photographer or a uh, professional cinema photographer, where if you're shooting in full raw, it means that you have more capabilities to edit it and post. Mm -hmm. And so with that, raw's file is much bigger and much more like time consuming, if you will. And so mm -hmm. the regular standard XD, uh, SD card can't handle it, CF Express does. For your case though, your camera won't allow you to shoot in the one that it doesn't have an SD card for, so you're fine. Same thing for you as well too. But it allows me to shoot in RAW though. You can shoot in RAW, but I don't think you can shoot video in RAW. Oh. Yes, you can do photo in RAW, which is yeah. totally fine. You got a V60 card, so it's perfect for that. Yeah. Um, if you were shooting RAW and video, that would be the R5 model, and I that's where you would I never even thought about shooting videos. I always, I always think about pictures, but yeah, that's a good Photo, one. Yeah, I, I've never done a video in RAW, so I don't know how any of the editing software goes for it, but I've heard it's a, it's a big file. It's a big file. Um, so yeah, getting an SD card reader definitely helps with that, and it's important, too, to remember what kind of card you're using and to get the appropriate SD card reader for that. I'm not particular on brands either, I should say that too. Um, I get a lot of people that ask about, you know, whether it's lenses, if getting a third party lens versus a, you know, OEM lens, or in this case, an OEM card reader like the Sony or Canon or Nikon would offer versus ProMaster. I think it's really all budgetary for you. Um, the third party companies will typically be a better value price on whatever the item is. And for something like a card reader, they're all made at a very good quality or a very similar quality, I should say. So buying the Sony one for an extra $100 compared to maybe a ProMaster one, uh, I don't really think there's too much of a What's difference the on it. I'd have to take a look, but I know, and they can go anywhere between like 30 to 40 bucks on the cheap end. I think that's for that double stick with the USB and the USB C on the end. Mm -hmm. And they can go all the way up to like 120 for some of the more expensive ones. And I think that big hub at the end is the 120 guy. Okay. Um, the one on the left. On the left, yeah. Okay. So moving back with the photos, moving, uh, what we were talking about before was moving photos and how to make sure that you're transferring your photos to your computer mm -hmm. simple, uh, just without ruining anything. It's a pretty simple practice. Mm -hmm. uh, but turning off the camera, waiting five seconds, removing that card, putting it in the reader, and then making sure that you are reading the card instead of trying to use the camera to get the photos oh, off of it. Yeah. Copy photos to a destination photo, uh, folder. Don't move them, copy them. Um, I'm a big stickler on the spilled coffee ID, ID, uh, idea with the laptop. You can have 10 years worth of your photos on your laptop and all you need to do is spill a cup of coffee on it and you're over, it's over, none of that's there. Uh, so when I have photos, I keep my photos on four different spots um, at all times. Okay. So when I first start, I tell people to move, copy the photos, don't move them, make a duplicate of them so that way they can stay on the SD card if you have the budget for having multiple SD cards. If not, make sure that you're moving them or copying them into an external hard drive of some sort. I always recommend to all photo people, you should have one terabyte hard drive on you. Uh, I keep two of them personally, so I have my work that I've had since you know, my 15 years as an artist. I have a giant hard drive that I keep in a safe uh, underneath my bed, just for God forbid if my house burns down or something, like that'll stay alive and I don't have to worry about it. And then I have another hard drive that lives right outside of my computer, so that way it's all saved on my computer, it's all saved on hard drive number one, and then it's safe in hard drive number two somewhere. So, you know, in a month's time, I probably have an extra 200 photos to add to that hard drive. So it'll be done in a race. Exactly. Photos, you know. But this gate covers all my bases, so that way anything bad were to happen, I could lose the camera, I could lose all my computers, but my work, all the 
time I've spent doing my hobby, it's still there. Um, and so that's what I recommend on it. You can also do things like cloud-based solutions. So Prime Photos and Google Drive are a great example. Huge fan of Google Drive. I don't have too much experience with Prime Photos. Um, I use Amazon Prime. And, how, and is it, what do you uh, think? Unlimited storage. Yeah. So Somebody needs to share all soccer pictures. Perfect. It's easy. Awesome. Super easy. How about uh, security and privacy? I mean, is that something that you're giving up for that? <sighs> I, I know that you have to agree to a, a lot of the terms and conditions with it. I have not seen, at least in my experience, I, I've used Google Photo, the, probably or Google Drive the most out of the bunch. I'm not as experienced with Prime Photos. Mm -hmm. But at least in my experience, unless I give somebody access to those photos or unless I'm physically sharing with them, there's really no way for somebody to get my info, get that stuff without getting into my Google account. Mm -hmm. And my Google account is basically locked by like three different ways of authentication. It has to send a text to my Google account in order for me to get in. Then it has to have me like verify by tapping which computer I'm on. It gives me multiple choices. Um, I mean, I use something similar now. I use OneDrive mainly for files right now. Yeah. Which is basically the same thing, but I've just always been using OneDrive for work and I started having my own personal yeah. yeah, OneDrive's oh, another one. I think actually in the next in a couple slides, I actually talk about OneDrive a little bit too as a as an idea for storage. But that's another great one too. Those those cloud based solutions have really gotten better over the years. Um, it's much easier to get into those accounts. It's not as convoluted. Um, I definitely recommend it because the way I think about it, with the hard drive, it's great. You get that external hard drive, but you got to carry that thing with you. And same th idea with the spilled coffee. You ruin it, it's over. Yeah. With an, uh, Google Photos, Prime Photos, OneDrive, you can go to Japan and all your photos will be on a computer in Japan. You can just log in at any time. You can go to Afghanistan, same idea, and then you can come home and, and still access them all there. Um, plus sharing them too is really easy on something like Prime Photos or Google Drive where you have the ability to send those things out to anybody you want just via an email or Dropbox. So I like that too. When you say copy, it's off of the uh, media channel. Uh, yeah, so... so but eventually you gotta, you gotta free up space too. You can't. I mean, so like I was saying earlier, I have like 60 different SD cards at home. I don't take I don't take my photos off my SD cards. I buy another little like case to put them in. I I am just so nervous because I I uh, never forget I was in school and I had this one girl who uh, she got her computer stolen and then uh, I was downtown for school for college and she got her one her laptop got stolen her apartment got broken into and her parents had a house fire and literally within like three months time this girl lost every single thing that she had made from being like ten years old to twenty two. And so, you know, she had nothing else, nothing, it's all gone. Anything that she sent in an email, she was able to get back, but that was really about it. So she sent a photo to someone in an email. So um, if you can save all that stuff to as many things as you can, you're just better off um, in the long run of things. You don't have to necessarily be so anal to do it like I do, where I've got my SD cards, I've got two hard drives and one lives in the safe. but. Um, I really like the cloud-based solution. I think as long as you're good at remembering a username and a password, and it's pretty cheap too. And it's cheap too. Yeah, yeah. you're saying unlimited storage, and Prime it just goes right through Prime. Amazon Prime, and we get that for free. What? That's yeah. awesome. See. Okay. <laughs> I don't use it for storage. I use it to share. I take pictures of my daughter's soccer games, okay. and, that's, and that's how I upload them and then share the link to that album with all the parents. Okay. And that's click cool. the link, and they have they can download full res pictures. I got Prime. I gotta start using it. <laughs> There's so many. I just found a little Prime video too. I just too. realized it was Amazon. You said Prime. Oh, yeah. Prime. It's exactly. <laughs> Amazon. Okay. It's Amazon. Yeah. And then lastly, eject the card before physically removing it. Um, there's a lot of the time, especially if you're transferring a couple thousand photos at a time or longer videos at a time, the SD card itself might still be in use. So making sure you physically eject it first. So if you're on Apple, just drag the SD card from the desktop down to the garbage can. That'll eject it. And it won't eject it until it's done transferring, which is great too. And you'll get a message on the computer saying it's been properly ejected. With Windows, it should be on the bottom right corner. There's um, a space to click to eject the SD card. Again, you want to do that so that way in case the card is still doing things on the computer, you don't accidentally start or stop it and you don't lose any of the files. Sometimes when you're in between a transfer, it's not uncommon if you don't eject it properly, if you just pull it out, it will delete that video that it was transferring or it'll delete all those files because they're kind of like in a limbo between the card and the computer. 
Hey, can I just share one thing? Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at both your cameras, and one of the things I'm invested in is gaffer tape. Yeah. As you can see, this is a Canon, but you don't know it's a Canon. And, it, you know, I don't want anybody, <laughs> give anybody a reason <laughs> to, you know, want to, you know, Hundred percent in my stuff. You know, I, so. I'm a. I've definitely. I'm a big fan of not putting brands on my stuff. Like I definitely try to hide or not right. like get anything with a brand logo on it. I'm. I'm cool with the brand. It's just it, it gives it gives somebody another like it's just a generic camera to them. Hundred percent. But if you see something that says Canon, Sony, Nikon, hey, and let me get this guy in the dark. You know, just thought I I feel like from from me with most of the cameras. Someone really wants, they're gonna come get it. <laughs> so that's that's always my side with it. My brand that I use for cameras a little less known. It's Fuji Film. Um, mm -hmm. So mine shoots very similar to a Sony, but it's a little bit different uh, as far as the controls go. Yeah. So everyone's a little different. It is funny though that we all have a different, different. brand right now, yeah. which I think is awesome. <laughs> All different camps. <laughs> Literally. And that's a, that's another thing, too, to, to get into with this is that anybody who's getting into photography, it doesn't matter if you're shooting on a Canon, a Nikon, or a Sony. You can read reviews. One might be better for one application over the other. Um, but the idea is that they all do the same thing, right? They're all going to have the mode dial, which we'll talk a little bit more about, and they're all going to take a picture. Um, so no camera that you get is a bad camera. It was um, a painful choice. I mean, I looked at both of these guys, and I... I didn't take this right away. I did a lot of research. A lot of research. And I was giving up something to get something for this and vice versa. So, you know. And that's how it goes with the It all came with a lot of reviews off. and a lot of homework. So. Yeah. And then going back into it, your backup plan starts at the SD card, goes to the computer, and then from there you got a couple options. The hard drive on the top there, that's the guy with the cable coming out of it, and then my cloud, cloud-based solution. <laughs> Make it real simple. Um, I don't really know, know how, to, how to demonstrate. <laughs> I'm like, it all goes up there, it's, it's there. Uh, but yeah, multiple options. You should always choose at least three backup options. Um, do the computer, do a hard drive, do the cloud. Keep it on the SD card, keep it on the computer, keep it on the hard drive. Keep it on the SD card, hard drive, the cloud. Choose one of choose three of those options, and you'll never ever have to worry about your photos disappearing on you overnight or something terrible happening. Will the SD card slow down the more storage you use? Not to my knowledge, and I could be wrong. If someone has something to correct on that, but depending on the speed of the SD card that you have, it should stay consistently at that speed regardless of the files that you have on there, because the SD card is kind of made to do that. Um, Maybe once you get towards the end, it'll really slow down. I think the, really the only time it would be slow for you is moving it to the computer and then trying to take all that information off there because there's so much on, side, on the SD card. Sure. It's more information for the computer to load and then get ready before then you can transfer a copy. Right. Um, okay. But yeah, we'll see if anybody else, and I'll do more research on that myself because I'm not sure. And then try and cloud-based solution. So you mentioned OneDrive, that's on there. Google Drive I have on the top left corner. And then my personal favorite is the Adobe Creative Cloud. I use that too. Great if it's all the editing software that you need is on there. So if you're a photographer, a videographer, you do graphic design of any kind, Creative Cloud's great, you get all their services, but then on top of that too, um, you get a cloud, and you can save your work to that. Other artists can view your work if you choose that. You can view others' galleries. They make like a personalized gallery. It's really great when you're trying to get inspiration or get feedback on your work. Um, it's really hard, especially if you're an amateur photographer, like you're not putting your work into a gallery. You know, you're not getting people to comment on your stuff to be like, oh, that looks nice, or you should try doing something like this. And it's that critique and feedback that makes art so, right. photo, all, everything so wonderful. So let's go through a tour of the camera. Uh, starting off with the top of the camera. So if you hold your camera upside down like this and just look at it from the top bottom, we got a few different buttons and, and uh, dials on here. So Video start and stop on the top there, or sorry, yeah, video start and stop. Usually on the cameras, you're gonna see a red dot somewhere on there. For my Sony camera, it's up on the top there. We're looking at a DSLR from Nikon right now. It looks like the D... That's your camera, man. Yeah, 4500? Well, I got the 56 on. Ah, there we go. <laughs> But regardless, we can see on there, so we got the video button, that's the red dot on there. Power switch is usually gonna be a toggle that's somewhere by the shutter release. Um, I don't know why they put the two there, I think it's just because it's easy for the fingers to kind of travel in between yeah, the two. Yeah, there you go. And that's only on their new ones too, right. they put oh, it on, really? yeah, they change it <laughs> up. Okay. 
But you should see your power switch on there. It'll turn to the on and off side, and then usually somewhere around there you see a shutter release. If not, the shutter release is going to be the circle button that's on there. Um, that is going to be what physically triggers the shutters to move inside the camera. Um, it's also your autofocus or your focusing button if you're not doing manual focus on the camera. Um, it's just a half click. Play with your camera, you should kind of get an idea of what I'm talking about if you don't. If not, message in. Shutter release, uh, underneath that exposure compensation. If you are looking at the LCD screen or you're looking through the viewfinder and you press on the um, exposure compensation on your camera and on the bottom of the screen, you should get a um, kind of like a, tick, uh, a ticker line that pops up where it's got one big line, it almost looks like a ruler. Mm -hmm. One big line, then you get these small lines underneath and then another big line, then these small lines and a big line. The exposure compensation reads the image, reads the area that you're pointing the camera at, and it tells you where its lightest and its darkest value is, mainly its lightest value, and it allows you then to play with the either the ISO or the exposure on the camera to make sure that you're dialing it in to get the proper photo. If you're using automatic, which is kind of what we're teaching right now, you don't need to worry about it too much. The camera does it for you. But let's say you're using an aperture, shutter priority, or a manual setting, the exposure compensation would come in handy for something like this. Moving down from there, we have a live view switch. Typically, you're going to see an LV somewhere on your camera. could be a toggle switch like it is by the mode dial for this Nikon, but it also could just be a standard button on the side of the camera. Live view is going to switch between what you can see on the LCD screen and what you're seeing through the physical viewfinder. Um, you can toggle. Some people hate looking through the LCD. Some people hate looking through the viewfinder. Some people kind of move between the two. They're a hybrid shooter. Um, do whatever is most comfortable for you. There's no right way or wrong way to doing it. Some old school uh, photographers will probably uh, make comments at you if you don't look through the viewfinder, but you got to do what's best for you. It's your camera. Um, the live view, though, lets you toggle between the two. So if you want that screen black the whole time, it'll save your battery life, and then you can just focus on using the viewfinder on the camera. Underneath that, we have a command dial. Now, it's going to look different on all cameras, and there's really no way to, to say that it's this and not this. But on most cameras, you're going to see a dial that's next to the modes, next to the on and off switch, sometimes by the exposure compensation. Uh, that dial is going to be a command dial depending on what you're doing. So when you're in the full manual, you can hold down multiple buttons on the camera to control the aperture, the ISO, and the shutter speed. When you're in aperture priority, the command dial is automatically going to be the aperture. If you're in shutter priority, that'll automatically be the dial too. So if you're doing things other than auto, your command dial will help you control those. We won't talk about it this week, but next week we'll talk about what all that basically means, the aperture and shutter. But that's where you would control it, is your command dial. So the whenever is priority, mm -hmm. priority equals command dial, basically. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So you can do auto. Auto won't give you any priority over it. The camera does all the work for you. Right. You just point and shoot. But let's say you go aperture, so that's where you know it's doing the iris of the camera, and it's either making it bigger or smaller. The camera will do the work on every other thing. You get to control that iris and to decide how big or how small it gets. Shutter speed, same idea. With the little dial there, you're controlling how fast it's shutting or how slow it's shutting. Okay, that's cool. Moving to the side of it, uh, actually, this is a D5600. Oh, yeah. that one's, yeah. I think the other, I have no idea. Either way. Flash button on the side there, you're going to see that with an arrow kind of going down. Almost looks like a Grateful Dead logo. Um, the flash button is going to be your control over the physical flash of the camera. Uh, you usually can change things in the settings to dictate whether or not the flash will automatically trigger if it senses low light situations. Um, but if you're shooting in automatic, you can turn the flash to pop up automatically and stay up the entire time. This little flash is attached because... Yes. And, and that's exactly DSL, oh, yeah. okay. DSLRs are still going to have the shoe for an external or just pop okay. Up. Uh, okay. Yep. Yeah, I don't have a pop up. But yeah, <laughs> you don't need one technically. It's uh -oh. kind of where it's at with that one because your camera is takes in a lot of light. It's built for more low light situations, okay. and that's the hard part with mirrorless and DSLR. Um, mirrorless. What is a DSLR? That's a DSLR. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And that's that's why it's got the flash on there. Okay. You're gonna make a good point. I cut you off. No, you're fine. Keep talking. Don't. No, you said the whole point about mirrorless and DSLR as well. Oh, sorry. 
Um, so mirrorless is the updated form of the DSLR. Right. The DSLR has a mirror on the inside that then reflects the image or reflects the light and then shoots it up to the sensor. So the sensor on his camera literally lives on the top and then his mirror bounces it up to the image. Uh, on a mirrorless camera, the sensor is right on the opposite side of the lens. So with yours, right. if you pop that lens off, you're going to see that kind of shiny, multicolored thing there. That's the sensor. Where his sensor lives on the top and it bounces up. That was the old school way of how they upgraded from the old SLRs, moving from film into digital. They put the sensor on the top and then allowed for the same kind of like reflection. How does it affect his low light ability? So the low light, it, it's because of the physical mirror. The way that it catches, the, the mirror has to get a certain amount of light in order to send that right. up to the sensor. You are avoiding the whole mirror. So whatever your camera senses via the light, it's taken natural light. Um, so yours, in theory, would do better in low light situations and in better stabilization. Videos on a DSLR are a little tougher because it can't stabilize via the light. Mm -hmm. um, and yours picks up much more light around you because there's nothing else that needs to get hit to show that light, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, DSLRs are slowly but surely getting phased out. Um, Nikon originally told us about five to six years before you no longer see DSLRs. Um, I went to the pro convention in Minnesota two weeks ago, and they said that it's more like two years now. All DSLRs will be gone. Um, it's kind of just the way of the world. The mirrorless have really taken over and, and just proved that there are, it's the next step of the camera evolution. Have you shown to the dark side yet? <laughs> I just started with this one. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's, we'll it's, be waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> It's the I'm next. really happy with this guy. Okay. No, it's, it's, it's exactly. Yeah, want, so. exactly. Cool. For sports photography, for everything you're doing, I think it's great for you. Now we just need to work on the autofocus thing for you, which we'll talk about later. But I think other than that, I think that's perfect for you. If you get into more videos, that's where we might have to have a conversation. Sure. Um, underneath, the fun underneath that, you have the function button. Function button can mul uh, be multitudes of different things based on the camera that you have. Most function buttons, too, you can actually manipulate and set and choose what you want it to be. Um, but take a moment when you got a time, click the FN button. It's typically a way for you to get into the settings for you to change things like your autofocus, um, for any white balance changing on there. Um, you can usually change a few other things that are slipping my mind. But the function button kind of acts as a settings button, but a quick quick settings rather than going into the physical kind of layout spiel of the camera. Zoom ring, we got that underneath. When you're looking at a lens, you should see two different kind of movable rings on there, depending on the lens that you have. If you have a zoom or a telephoto lens, the zoom ring is going to affect the camera and make it go up and down, basically. For my lens that I have, I have a 28 to 70 millimeter. Moving that, fo or moving that zoom ring is going to change my millimeter size on the camera. And above that, I then have my focusing ring. If you are using autofocus, which my lens doesn't have a toggle for it, it's on the camera body itself. If you're using autofocus, the focus ring doesn't matter. You don't have to focus on it. Not funny. Uh, but if you are someone who manually focuses and you're trying to do that effect, so that way you can really control relation between your background and your fore or your foreground and your um, background, then you want to use the focus ring on there. Underneath that, you have the lens retract button. Again, not something everybody's going to have. On some of the telephoto lenses, given that there's no motor on some of the DSLR lenses, you have what you call is the, the retract button. And that's made so that way, let's say you're traveling, you can snap your lens and you'll hear a click at the very end when it's closed. If you try to then rotate it, it won't let you rotate anymore. So you have to hold down that retract button in order to move the lens back and forth. Not every lens is going to have it. Most new mirror. Most mirrorless cameras, uh, Canon RF. No, that's your release button. That's oh, what takes the lens off. So yeah, yours probably won't have it. Yours so most likely. Only the, my wide angle has it. Yep. So I've, I've installed the lens already, but in order to use it, I have to push that oh. and, and enable it. So now that's wow. the lens's range, and then to detach the lens, I have to lock it again. So now it's locked. Yep. Before I remove it. What's the function of that? Uh, with these, with the, those cameras, because there's really not any like uh, motor or like auto service on there, that's one of the things that it does. So that way, let's say you're traveling with it, the lens doesn't just like open up while you're traveling and, and start to kind of act up. And you probably it probably because the telephoto has something inside of it where the either the AI or the mechanics of it are a little bit more 
together where it won't move like that. You really got to move that one where that is like a loosey goosey, if you will. I think that was the only. Oh, lens release button. So that's pretty self explanatory as well. There's a button on the inside of your camera, usually on the front face. You press that down, that'll allow you to take the lens off so that way you're able to put a new lens on there or throw your body cap back on. Drive mode button, that's on the bottom of the cameras, or you'll see it on the side, or if you are Sony, you are not going to put that anywhere where I can see it. Uh, I do love Sony, but sometimes. <laughs> Regardless, though, the drive mode button on there. So if we look at the picture, you can see that there are some squares stacked up, and then there's a timer or a stop and watch next to it. Uh, that dictates what type of image bursting you're doing or what type of imaging you're going to be doing. Are you taking a single still photo? Are you taking a burst shot? So are you taking you know, 10 frames in a second because you're doing sports? Are you doing a timer on there? Are you setting this up on a tripod and trying to run in front of the camera before you do it? That's also available in the drive mode button. And Those you can, are actually on the menu, but not on anything that's tactile. You got it on the menu for that yeah, one? I, I, know, I know it's an icon. Right? Yeah. 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 So some, some of them, for example, like yours probably now is getting to the point where the newer cameras, and I didn't actually even know that myself, they don't even have a drive mode on the physical button. Because usually it's one of those things when you're shooting, you can see it on the LCD screen and then right. you can toggle between it so that way it's ready to go when you're shooting. Gotcha. And then we'll go to the next one. All right, so menu button. Uh, very similar to FN, except now you're going to get into the more nitty-gritty parts of the camera. This is where you can change um, where things are being saved, image quality, you can change ratio aspect. Um, if your camera allows for filters, which I believe the R6 does, you can change filters on there and kind of have more of a fun with it, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't actually affect the way it's, the photo's being taken, but it plays with the coloration or saturation of the photo. It's kind of fun. Um, from there, diapeter adjustment, just like a pair of binoculars. If you pick up a pair, uh, if you look through it right away, you're probably not going to see much. You need to adjust the diapeter on there so that way you can clearly see through the lenses based on how your eyes are built and set up. Um, info button, past that one. What I recommend to a lot of photographers that are just getting started is when you're shooting in the automatic setting to start with, um, Take as many photos throughout the day as you can. Really get used to just shooting. Click When you find all the photos that you really like, click the info button on there. And there should be uh, a histogram where it shows you the light and how different saturation points are kind of meeting. And it'll look like a weird mountain formation from Lord of the Rings. Then underneath that, you're going to see all of the different stats for the camera. Yeah. So it should then tell you ISO, should tell you what the shutter speed was, should tell you what your um, exposure compensation looked like, and then it should also tell you what your um, shutter speed was. And it's a great way for new photographers to just take good photos, but then at the same time like look at there and say, oh, okay, so this is what my camera did to take this type of photo. In the future, this is what I'll do. I did exactly that about two weeks ago in yeah. front of my home where I just had a bush I was taking a picture of, yeah. focused on one part, took a picture, changed a little, took another picture, and then I was hitting the info and it just, whatever picture I took, it gave the stats. It gave was, everything. Yeah. You know, and if you like it, write those stats down. 100%. You know. And it gives it, what I like about it is, you know, there's no one way to shoot a photo. And I think that's another thing people get hung up on is they, they sit there and they go, well, I should be using this ISO because the sun is in this position. It's like, it's all touch and feel. You know, you're going to be out there and a cloud is going to come over 10 seconds after you just set it up and got it ready to go. And now you're going to have to change the lighting again on the camera. So there's so many different things. I think what the, the info and what all of the information basically does is it's, it's your adjustment. When you're when you've cooked for so long, you don't sit there and read the recipe. You kind of just eyeball it. You know how much salt to throw in. You know how much pepper. It's the same idea with the exposure, with your ISO, with everything else on the camera. You'll learn and touch and feel as you go. I, I always tell beginners, auto is your best friend until you feel more comfy. Uh, info, then you've got your focus and exposure lock. Uh, sometimes those are going to be inside the settings of the camera, but I know that I have it right here. It shows AF on. Uh, and the settings on this guy, it shows AEL and AF-L. Uh, um, that's your way of exposing and how it locks and how it sets on the camera. Uh, you might have that button available, but you might also just have it if you click the function button, where then you can choose what type of focusing you're doing. Yeah, I have it actually. You got yours on there? Yeah. Perfect. 
image playback button, pretty self-explanatory. P button there, or uh, sideways triangle with a square, that's your play button to go back and look at all the photos that you've taken. Using the multi-selector just below that, you'll be able to go through and rotate through your photos. And then the OK button is how you can then select the photo, uh, either to delete it or to maybe send it or to maybe look at the stats of it, what have you. Underneath that, you'll have a magnify and a demagnify button. Um, what I really like about the demagnify and the magnify button on cameras is when I'm shooting, one of the things I do to check the graininess and the blurriness of my photo and kind of where my background and foreground separation goes is I magnify all the way into the photo as far as I can before it becomes too pixelated. That helps me sometimes, especially when I'm doing things where I'll try to blur the background out and get a nice bokeh effect and just keep my subject in frame. Um, I will go to that magnify button, zoom in all the way, and see if my figure or my um, subject is in the frame or in the, um, what's the term I'm looking for, in the clearness that I want them to be and that my background is far enough kind of removed from the subject matter and I can play with that. Um, so the magnify button might come in handy if you're trying to check the smaller details of the photo to see how crisp and clean they are, how much noise is there. And that's really about it for the main buttons on there. Um, there's, you know, all cameras are going to be set up a little differently. You're going to see them either not on the camera or you're going to see them in various parts. Like you were saying, it's an ability on the screen but not a physical button for you to click. Right. So you're going to see that across the board. Getting into the mode dial, all brands are going to do this a little bit differently, but it's important that you know what each of those letters stand for. Now, when we look at a brand like Sony on the bottom there, you, you only get a couple options. You don't really get too much. Same thing with that should be the Nikon in the left corner, and then I believe that is the old way that Canon used to do it. Canon used to give you more options on there, and they've taken away most of those. Mm -hmm. um, I believe now in Canon, you should have an advanced photo setting that's supposed to be like your advanced auto. You have A, B, T, V, P, F, V. A plus, which is a green, yep. and you'll be C1, C2, C3, and uh Got it. So your auto is now basically all of those things underneath. Canon used to do it in a way where they said, oh, yeah, there's auto, but now you can do more of a portrait automatic where it's going to set the camera to separate the background and make the foreground pop more. Landscape was going to do a good job of doing a wide autofocus. Um, kids was meant for things that moved fast and were small. Uh, sports, moving fast, macro, close up, nighttime, pretty self explanatory. The big buttons to always remember on here, though, are going to be auto or A+. That is your auto control over all settings and functions of the camera. All you got to do is point and shoot the thing. Very simple. Your M is then your full control over it. Um, a lot of professional photographers I know and I talk to will either sit between manual or A or S. And I'll talk about the other two in a second. But full manual gives you control over the entirety of the photo. You can set everything from an exposure compensation to ISO to your f-stop and then to your um, shutter speed. So depending on what you're doing, you have full control over how the camera is going to function and operate. Uh, if you take a blurry photo, it's you who took the blurry photo, not the camera. That's what I always tell people with that, too. Uh, a or AV, it, it changes. I really don't know what the V means on there. I've been trying to figure that out. If anyone's got anything online, please tell me. But A is your aperture priority. Um, we'll get more into it next week with it, but aperture is as simple as thinking about as the iris. If you look at your lens and you pull that guy off, you're going to see a tiny little hole. And then as you're taking photos and, uh, and such, you're going to see that it expands, shrinks, expands. The iris acts the same way as our eye's iris does. When more light comes in, our eye doesn't necessarily need to keep its iris all the way open because there's enough light coming in, so it makes the iris smaller. When there is less or less light, our iris opens up all the way so we have better depth and field and we can see better. Cameras function the same way, but the aperture and the reason why you're using the aperture is a lot different from how the human eye functions, but very similar concept. Shutter speed. How fast are those two shutters on the inside of the camera closing? Um, you can do it where the shutters never close and you do very long exposure. 
You can also do it where the shutter closes in five hundredths of a second. And um, the, really the only thing you're going to see is if it's like a bumblebee or a hummingbird, you'll see its wings stop. And it's really cool. Um, all stuff that we talk more about on the intermediate side. But that's what the S stands if, for. If the shutter is very slow, is a, is a tripod then manual? You can. I, I mean, mean, is, is it, is it a necessary? necessary? Depends on what you're shooting. Um, one of the examples I give is the long exposures I see of like the expressway shots. I get a lot of people who they'll set their camera up overlooking an expressway, and when it's nighttime and the cars are going back and forth, uh, you get these right. like wisps of lines, right, cool. and it looks awesome. You would definitely need a tripod for that. Right. Um, everything in your scene should basically be still. So you know concrete dividers, the street will be still, the only movement you'll have is the cars, and if you don't have that on a tripod, then all you'll have is movement and it won't look as nice. Mm -hmm. um, so depending on the long exposure, yeah, if you're doing anything that, I mean honestly, if you're holding it for a second or more if, uh, for the shutter, you should definitely have a tripod. Okay. Anything lower than a second, you might be able to get away with holding, mm -hmm. um, but it's still like, if you wobble just a little bit, the mm -hmm. camera will get it. The, the best thing is with video, the camera really does a great job of making sure that when you're shooting on video, you have great stabilization, mm -hmm. but it's also because it's f-stop isn't nearly, or it's, um, it's, uh, oh, it's, sh it's shutter isn't moving like that, it's right. moving quicker. Mm -hmm. P is the program, so, Aperture, shutter, and, uh, and shutter speed are auto, but everything that you have is uh, changeable. So you can change the ISO on there, you can program the aperture to be auto or to be um, movable. Program basically allows you to do whatever you want, but then you set the controls on there. And every time you go back to the P on your camera, it will always be the same. Mm -hmm. So if in the future maybe you like to have an auto ISO, an auto shutter, but you want to control the aperture and you want to play with exposure compensation when you're doing it, you can do that. Um, vice versa, maybe you only care about the shutter and every once in a while you want to play with the aperture, um, and, but you also like to manipulate the ISO and the exposure comp, you can do that too. Uh, if there's any extra settings that you have inside the physical settings of the camera, um, maybe things to do with the white balance, to do with the saturation, to do with the color levels or the histogram stuff, you can also have that set up in program too. Um, so the more advanced you become with full manual where you kind of realize, oh I like this but I don't like this and I want this to be controlled, P kind of gives you the best of both worlds between auto and manual where now what you want is auto and, man and what you want is manual. You get to decide. Can you say? Can you say more than one profile? That's what that C one, C two are on yours. Ah, so the custom one, custom two. I didn't put it on here, but those are also fully, uh, fully customizable. And then again, same thing. When you leave them, they stay at where you're at. Okay. B, which isn't on these guys anymore. I think it's on some of these older I ones. Be. You still got to be. It's bulb. It's what? Bulb is what they call it. Okay. Bulb basically is a fully customizable. But as long as you're holding down the shutter release, that camera is going to stay open. So on the inside where your shutters are, if you hold down the bulb, you basically get that unlimited exposure until you cut it. Oh. So that's where the expressway shots would come in. I have some other images on here that also kind of give examples of like what that would be like. I never noticed the B till you put that on there. Yeah, right? I just, oh, I got a B. Yeah. <laughs> but it, as always, to anybody who's brand new on this, you two have been shooting for a little bit, so you don't have to worry too much about it, but start with auto. Um, I can't tell you enough how many customers buy a camera, they think it's going to work right out of the box and they, they move to M where they put it on the on the aperture priority and then a week later I got them complaining because it just it's not <laughs> taking a good photo. It, it, it's not the baseball player, it's not the uh, bad, it's the baseball player. Um, it, it's as simple as, you know, using the auto, it, it's a cheat code in a sense, but when you're first getting into a camera it's so important to, to experiment with that because when you get an image that actually looks right but maybe you could play with a little more and tweak and make it look better based on the settings of the camera that's a lot better than looking at a blurry photo and being like I don't know what to do so no, that, that's my recommendation to start start with auto um, using scenes these are automatic modes I kinda talked about that a minute ago again I don't really have anybody in the class to explain that, or that needs to know about the scenes let me see if anybody made a question about it um, 
no, nobody's made any questions about scenes. If you have an older DSLR camera, I believe from Canon series, you might have scenes on there. Honestly, if you toggle between them on the physical computer uh, or on the physical camera, they give you a brief explanation of what each one of those things does. Canon's really great about that. If you use, if you're switching between the modes and you click info, you can actually find out what each of those modes do, and it tells you a little bit more about them. But if you don't have those on there, automatic is going to do all of that for you. So don't even worry. <laughs> and then this is my favorite. Um, my camera doesn't work. This is actually a photo that a customer sent me. Um, guys, your camera works. It's it's just the settings. It's just playing with the dials. Um, work, eh? <laughs> it is not the baseball bat. It's the baseball player. Um, it's yeah. Now few more things before we start ending this guy up. Your camera isn't a smartphone. It's important to remember that. When you're taking a photo on a smartphone based on then taking or versus taking a photo on a camera, there's a lot of things you have to remember. The phone is going to take a great photo. There's no doubt about that. Um, but now if you zoom into that photo, it's going to start to get blurry. If you try to print that photo, it won't print properly the aspect ratio of the photo is made to work for the phone screen, to work for the texting format, to work for emailing computer format. When you use a camera, the photo format is a little bit different. The ratio is a little bit different. The camera picks up more information and more detail. So if you want to print any photos out, printing on a phone or printing from a phone image versus printing from a camera image, it's going to look a lot more shoddy and more pixelated, more blurry. If you want to give grandma a really nice picture of the family, you're not going to print out the photo from the phone, you're going to print it out from the camera. Um, so keep that in mind with it. Phone is great for snapshots, for something quick, but you're really not going to get what you want out of the phone the same way you're going to get out of a the camera. There's a lot more robustness, there's a lot more information, um, and there's just more technical aspect that goes into a photo that makes it look so much more unique and detailed compared to the phone shot. Uh, holding your camera, it might seem pretty self-explanatory, but I feel bad for people who have punches in their necks or like look like they're in pain when they're holding a camera. Keeping good posture and keeping your hands at a good position. Um, you know, if you flail your elbows out to the side, you kind of look silly while you do it, but at the same time too, this is going to start to hurt the forearms and do stuff. You're holding about a pound to two pounds in your hands, depending on what you got. You're probably close to the three. It's a, a, you're, a big, you're a big camera. With the, and I, oh, this I, I remember. Yeah, I was gonna say we talked. That was the lens we talked about. Uh, yeah, make sure you're using proper posture. The nice thing too is you know stabilization. We talk about that within the cameras. The cameras have built-in stabilization. When you use a neck strap, that's one way of using um, a kind of a fake or a easy stabilization. It locks around your neck. You tug on that. And now it's going to stay nice and straight. I have a little more wiggle on there still, but this is an easy way to stabilize. The second way that you can do it is just tuck your elbows in and have them rest either on like the rib cage or on the belly, whatever works best for you. But doing that is going to help keep the camera more stabilized. It's also going to help the camera be less shaky. It's also going to give you better grip and posture. You can keep your back straight while you're doing it um, and you don't, you know, yeah, it, it, it just looks better and it's going to help in the long run. Um, there's so many things out there about people who draw or paint like myself where you can get arthritis in your hands later on. Um, the same thing goes for a photographer. You keep clicking these buttons and holding your fingers up here. That kind of stuff happens over time. So using the best practices like lift with your knee or lift with your knees, not your back. Stuff like that that you want to keep in mind when you're shooting. Um, focus, then shoot. And when you do shoot, shoot through the picture. Um, focus the camera. If you're experimenting and you're trying to become a new photographer and you're trying to find all the fun stuff, um, I have a lot of friends that love to just go out. They don't even point. They just or they don't even focus. They just shoot, and they have really cool photos. Some of them. Um, other ones are terrible. Uh, but if you take your time, focus, and then you shoot the camera, you'll. 90 times out of 100 get a great photo that either has little to no blur, has maybe a little motion to it, but overall it just looks right. Um, and when you do shoot, shoot through the picture. I have a lot of people that, you know, they'll sit, they'll take the picture quickly and then they pull back right away to start looking. Keep that camera up there and take one or two shots. Shoot through so that way you know that you're getting not only what's in front of you, but you're getting multiple angles of that so that way for every reason you go through, if one's blurry, the other one, the other two might not be. And you can then pick between them all. Um, 
but again, better practice for getting a better shot. So shoot the pitch when you stay taking multiple shots and then taking eliminating multiple. what you don't want. Or yeah, you... but also not looking at just like the, it's, it's kind of tough, but not looking at the surface level of the photo, looking past that person uh -huh. to see what's going on. Like if I was shooting you right now, I probably would look towards the back of you too to see what's happening there and shoot not just you, but through you to get right. that stuff too. Okay. Because that background is going to be determined too on like, you know, if I want to do something with uh, separation of background to foreground, if I'm just trying to get a good clean portrait of you or if I'm trying to show you in the room. That's mm -hmm. kind of where I'm at with shooting through the gotcha. photo is um, thinking about what you're trying to get. Like, what, you know, if you're pointing a camera at something, what are you trying to take a picture of? Awesome. And shooting through that so that way you're getting that in the photo and you're not just kind of getting like a, a lazy version of what you were trying to do. Don't be conservative. It's free. Literally. You're not developing film. Take you're it. You're paying for prints. Take and many and if you do shoot with film I don't know, be 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 don't be conservative either just keep shooting with it like it's film is another one too some people you know, get really that? I know <laughs> love shooting in film but wow is it, it it's a thing uh, if you are the camera or moving you will get blurry photos again the the stuff I just talked about with the tripod doing that stuff if you're doing long exposure you definitely want to use a tripod um, but if you are someone who naturally has shaky hands or you just don't, you know, you wobble a little bit too much, invest in a monopod, invest in a gimbal, invest in something that gives you some sort of stabilization so that way you can avoid taking blurry photos and you can take cr clean, crisp images and not have to get flustered or upset with your own work. Uh, basics to taking great photos. So these are just some tips and tricks that I talk about for shooting through the camera, what to look for when you're shooting. Um, first thing is fill the frame. Uh, it can differ. You know, this could be something where you don't want to fill the frame. It could be something where you do. What I like to tell people, though, is if you're shooting portrait photography or you're doing pictures of other people, a lot of the times having excess, um, we'll call it negative space in this case. Uh, negative space would be the stuff around our subject matter that isn't directly implementing our or um, directly um, affecting our subject. So, for instance, the wall behind her, that's all negative space. None of that is needed and it doesn't benefit fit the photo. If anything, it kind of washes her face out, makes her look a little bit more pale than she needs to, um, and kind of creates this weird contrast between the darkness of her hair and then her skin tone. Moving over to the right side, we have less of the background, so we have kind of a still, quiet background there, not as much negative space, and now our attention is all on her. Um, her skin looks like it's definitely a different color than the background, and then on top of that, too, the contrast of the hair within all the different grays on the photo look really nice. Um, so one way of taking a better photo is thinking about filling the frame if it's appropriate. What if we propped out the door? Would that be... Uh the door frame that you want an acceptable photo of her moving into the frame? You could. I mean, but what's that, what's that, like, what is all that wall really helping you with? Is there yeah, any there's context? Not, there's nothing really there, so, right, it's if, just gray space. If I was shooting you, for example, and I had maybe the stuff behind you and you were a cook or a chef of some sort, it might be appropriate to have right. that stuff. Okay. Same thing for you. If you were maybe someone who was selling up here and, and you were selling the higher-end appliances, getting the higher-end appliances behind you gives more context to where you're at. But if I'm just trying to take a nice picture for you to put on your resume and you want a nice clean headshot, I'm probably going to go with the one on the right. Yeah, that, that grayness tells my story. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Nothing that at least benefits the photo. I always think of like what benefits the photo or what tells more of the story. Eyes in the top third. Um, it's kind of a weird thing to think about, but when you're looking at a photo, if you can divide a photo's plane into three sections, so I think of if you can Chicago flag it where you've got one on the top, three stripes going on there, then you can divide where you're meeting in this photo or where certain things lie in the photo. One of the tricks that I've picked up on is if you keep the subject, uh, subject matter's eyes in the top third, you kind of create this, there's a, I, I want to say hierarchy scale, but it doesn't really necessarily make sense in this case. But there's a certain angle that we're seeing on this one where we have a little bit of subject matter on the left side. It's a little bit of negative space, but we see the brick wall. It kind of adds to the coloration of it, and it helps the pink of his shirt pop. It helps the hair pop a little bit more, even though his hair is similar to the brick color. Um, but it keeps him in full focus and adds just a little bit of flair to the image. Something else that you can look at when you're shooting, especially portraiture work. Eyes in focus. 
Nikon is one of the best as far as focusing on the eyes go. They have one of the most advanced eye tracking and eye redness reduction um, technologies and cameras. But one of the tricks that you can always do as a photographer is focus in on the eyes. A lot of the times you hear that expression in the eyes, the gateway to the soul. A lot of the times though the eyes, if they're stabilized properly and if you track onto them properly, they'll make the entire rest of the subject stay in perfect uh, stillness and in frame, um, won't really allow for much blurriness. And the eyes as a whole are usually some of the most um, interesting parts of portraiture work. You know, we could look at skin and we can look at what the skin tone is and we can look at the, um, you know, blemishes or no blemishes of the skin. We could look at hair. We could look at, you know, the way the eyebrows, anything else that you want to say. But the eyes typically are the first thing that we're drawn to when we look at a portraiture work of any kind. We first gravitate towards the eyes and then we break from there and start looking at other things. So if you're trying to wheel your um, audience in with your photos, you might want to focus in on the eyes as your start. And then also, if we break this into three sections of the photo, her eyes are in the top third of the photo. <laughs> Getting on their level, um, this is something that I've discovered over time, but family photo or family vacations, family parties, um, scenes where people are little people are involved, children. Um, it's kind of tough when you're taking pictures from above. That hierarchy scale comes into effect where you're shooting down on the children so it makes them look even smaller than they really are. And on top of that too, given the movement, given everything else that's going on, the camera has a harder time locking on the tops of their heads. So one thing I recommend to people is get on the level of the kids who are or whatever the event is going on. When I take photos of my dogs or if I take pictures of my little cousins, that's the first thing I'll do is I'll squat down or I'll try to, if, depending on the camera, some of these guys have uh, little like flip up screens that go like this and I can then also angle my camera low mm -hmm. and I can get on the level without having to bend myself over. Save your back. Exactly. Uh, yours a little different. You got the flip out screen so yeah, you can kind of do that because you can tilt exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You're, you also yeah. have it. Yeah. It swings out. Yeah. I like this one. So it's, it's nice, especially sports. If you're doing something where a ball's involved, uh, I have a lot of uh, guys who will do like the torso shot moving a soccer ball. And I've seen some really cool ones where you don't see the person moving, but you get the legs. But the, camp, the shot was done like on eye level. So it's like you are at the level of the ball, mm -hmm. and it just looks really cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, so a simple thing to make your photos look a little bit better, especially when it comes to little guys, because they can be tricky. You get a lot of photos like this. A lot of photos like this. <laughs> or go lower than that. Um, especially with kids or with anybody who has any height difference. Uh, I call it like the Napoleon syndrome in a sense, where if the smaller the person is or the smaller the subject matter is, the more on a level that you can get or the more low that you can get below them, it changes that hierarchy scale and it, again, gives more power to the photograph than the person viewing it. And I think that's the importance to, to kind of look at it with. Um, more of an art side of things, but it helps when you're taking a, a nice clean photo. Rules of thirds, so we talked earlier about breaking an image down into three sections. It can go both horizontal or vertical, and where we see those red circles are the crosshairs of the rule of thirds. If you as a photographer are either doing one of two things, you are either going to have whatever the subject matter is hit one of those dots, or you're going to have whatever the subject matter is live perfectly in one of the third planes, if that makes sense. Um, the red dots are usually the prime area for it, um, but in certain circumstances we can see a subject be on either the far right plane, the middle plane, or the left plane, or top, middle, bottom, depending on what it is too. Did you have an overlay grid on your camera too that would... Yeah. <laughs> and that, that's... I, I shoot with my grid on all the time and it's definitely... It helps a lot. I do now. <laughs> I do... <laughs> on my camera, I shoot with it here and there. I toggle between. It's one of my function settings, but I do it all the time on my cell phone. Okay. The cell phone, if, if you're... If you like... For anybody who does love taking photos with the cell phone, you set the grid up on your phone and it is a wonderful tool to have, especially if you're doing landscape shots or let's say the kids are doing something and you just want to get like a nice picture of them. Having the grid really helps you set up and kind of really manipulate how you want your photo to work. The grid is an option on settings? Yeah, okay. yeah grid is an option on settings. And it should say grid and it should pop up just like this. Okay, good. So some examples. So we can start by... 
um, when we refer to the way that the sky and the land touches, we're going to call that the horizon line. That's the art term for it. There's another term called the vanishing point where it is a dot that lives on the horizon line that all of our subjects basically go to. We call that one point perspective. Naturally, when we're doing like drawing or painting, we've been making one point perspective for thousands of years at this point now. But when we look at images, our mind can naturally see these lines kind of converging on a point and we're attracted to those. So as a photographer, if you can frame those lines up and make them more visible to pop towards your uh, people, you'll, it'll come right away. So my two examples, um, horizon line is going to be where the sky and the water and sand meet. So we can see that blue line that goes across. That line is almost perfect with the top line up there. So it crosses between two points of our rule of thirds. We then can look at the um, flip-flop at our surfboard guy. He has his surfboard. Uh, he is sitting perfectly at the one point and his shadow is also sitting at the bottom point. So we have a really nice cross kind of going on here with our rule of thirds. But the image itself, if those lines weren't there and you took this picture, it'd be a really clean, crisp image. Um, on top of that, we have one more thing we'll talk about, about the sun being on the back. Uh, I talk about it on another slide where I show a good example of it, but that's a great, a great view of that too. As a photographer, if you can put the sun either behind your back or behind your subject's back, you're going to allow for a better lighting sequence to kind of happen on the image. And I have some better examples of that. But this is a perfect example of the rule of thirds. And I have a few more. Well, the sun has to be setting a horizon too, right? Yes. If you can, I mean, in this case, yeah, uh, the, the, the sun would be setting in this case. But like if... If there was no sun, wherever the sun is located or wherever it would be, even if it was the moon, it's all about lighting and where that lighting sits. And I'll show you an example. Mm -hmm. um, but for this case, uh, yeah, the sun's setting behind this guy. We're getting a nice hue that builds around him. So it's basically oversaturating the subject matter, keeping him all black. So we get this really cool effect where... Sure. Exactly. And then the sky by itself has a gorgeous coloration to it. And then our subject, who is important, it's important, but we know automatically he's a surfer guy. We don't really need more other than that. Right. Surfer dude. Exactly. <laughs> Another beach one, these are really popular. I like it because they really illustrate the horizon line on that one. Perfect example where the sky and the water meets, that's almost perfect on that white line. Where the girl is on this case, she is standing on that one on the on the opposite side of the rule of thirds, and she is between the two points right there. Um, on top of that, too, we have the sun coming through the clouds. It's positioned behind her, but up and away from the subject. So we're not losing any detail in her. She's not becoming oversaturated by any color. I would say the only part that bothers me is the washed outness of where the water and the beach are meeting. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of light that's hitting that, and I'm, at my eyes, have a harder time differentiating between the two. Um, you can obviously tell, but... At first glance, it might be a little bit yeah, deceiving. Cleaned up in post too, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It also could be ex uh, set by exposure compensation. Mm -hmm. uh, the photographer in this case probably could have lowered the exposure compensation just a smidge so that the light itself wasn't as pungent on the photo. Maybe it came out a little bit more darker, and then in post she could have or they could have um, changed the lighting on there. This is a rule of thirds, and this also goes into the um, converging lines that I was talking about. So. We have two buildings on the right and the left. If we look at the way that the windows and the fencing on those things are looking, they all look like they're kind of pulling back towards a corner. And that is our view on one point perspective, where we can see these lines all looking like they would converge into one point. And if we took a ruler and we just traced those lines to there, almost everything would perfectly go to one dot that sits on the horizon all the way in the background of these guys. But Besides that point, we have two different sets of people, a brother and a sister, husband and wife, I assume, that are sitting within the rule of thirds. The daughter and the brother are definitely closer to what I would have liked to see the two. It kind of bothers me that she's like perfectly in the middle and they're like, yeah, exactly. So if he just moved over to the right like two inches, it would have been great. Uh, but it still gets the message across. 
they are sitting perfectly, the kids, in the one side of the rule of thirds. The husband and the wife are sitting on the other side. The photographer definitely did this so that there was a space differential between where they're standing. So the parents being taller, they're further back, but they almost look like they're on the same plane as the kids. They're obviously not in focus as much, so that means that the f-stop was definitely a, um, a higher number. The parents aren't blurred, but you definitely can't see their face in clear detail. So there's more um, intention and more um, uh, purpose behind just getting the kids in this one. And then Jim, I like this one because I think The Office did a really good job of framing. We talked about negative space and we talked about filling the frame in one of the earlier slides. In this case, for The Office, they're doing the perfect thing of having the rule of thirds. We look at Jim's eyes and he's sitting on the top third of almost. He's just a little bit below it. Mm -hmm. But we can see the negative space on the left side of him is perfect in the sense of giving location and giving ideas. Anybody who's watched The Office, you know automatically that's the conference room. You recognize the tree, you see the shutters on the one side. You're giving context to where the person or where the subject is located during the shoot, um, but you're not overbearing me with negative space. Could you probably get rid of all the extra filler and just focus in on Jim? Yeah. Um, would the show have gotten the point across of like the mundaneness and the funniness of working in a nine to five office every day? Maybe not. Um, so again, it, it's artistic liberty and choice that you get to take as a photographer, as a cinematographer, for how you want to set up and make your images show. Some on the back, this is more of what I was talking about earlier. So bad and better, we have the sun, which in this case is just above him, it feels like, or just below them. I can't really tell on the top one where the sun is exactly. On the bottom one, it looks like it's on the top there. But with the first one on the top, the reason it's a bad photo is he's hunched in and he's got the fish in front of him. By doing that, we're blocking off any light that could really hit his chest and bounce off and add more color to it. The fish is in the same boat too. Because the fish is being darkened and hidden, and you can see the shadow that goes, actually, I take that back. The sun is at the back of the photographer. Mm -hmm. That's why I couldn't tell. Yeah, because I could see the shadow that's being cast on from the guy right now, and you could see the extra arm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the sun is coming from behind. So in this case, the photographer is blocking out the sun in this one, and that's why everything looks overly dark. When the photographer steps back and allows for the sun to be at the back but not being converged or hidden by the back, we're now letting more light hit our subject matter. You can see the fish is in more detail. His shirt is in more detail. He's wearing a baseball cap, which I probably would have had him take it off if I was actually trying to get a clean photo. <laughs> baseball caps always cause drop shadow on a subject. Mm. Um, but in this case, the way that the sun's hitting him, and that's the other reason why I know it's coming from the front, is because his face is in full color and we can see everything in detail, his smile, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. It was important to keep in mind when you're shooting Rule of thirds, think about where everything is on the image, but then also think about your natural lighting. Um, when you're indoors, it's a different situation, but the outside world is a whole different ball game when you're taking photos, and you have to be con uh, conscious of your sun, because that is your main light source. Last thing we'll talk about is using timer or camera apps. I talked in the beginning about transferring photos and doing all that stuff. You can transfer from your phone to your or from your camera to your phone. It's really not a problem. It's great if you want to post a few pictures on Instagram or social media. Um, but if that's your primary source for sending your photos from one to the other, you're going to lose the quality of the image a lot over the time. And then on top of that too, it's going to kill your camera battery. Um, I really only recommend it if you're on vacation and you want to post a picture of the Bahamas while you're in the Bahamas. Go for it. Mm -hmm. Other than that, you can use the apps as a timer. You can use the apps sometimes in editing solutions. They even allow you where you can do live view on the camera, where you have the camera going and then the phone, it's showing you everything through the phone. Um, there's a lot of different tools. All camera brands have a different app associated with them, so look into what your camera brand offers as far as apps. And then when you download it, if you've got questions, you can always come back to me with those. Recommended accessories. Um, if you're just starting, get a camera, get a lens, get an SD card. When you buy the camera, it should come with a strap. SD card is all you need for storage. And then a lot of lenses, when you first get them, they'll come with a kit. You get a nice kit lens, great way to start. If you don't get one of those, get a lens. And that's really the basic bare bones that you need. 
Um, this is what I would recommend once you're getting, if you're really getting into it and now you want to be more of a photographer and you're like, let's go for it. A bag is great. Traveling with a bag is awesome. Keeps everything protected, especially if you buy more lenses in the future. Um, an extra battery of some sorts. I've made it through 12 to 15 hours of just shooting photos on my one battery, um, but I've also made it eight hours because I've shot some videos. Uh, I, anytime I go out and I'm taking photos, even if it's just for fun, if it's a family, I carry two batteries. Um, just put them in my back, back, back pocket so I have them. Have extra memory cards. Sometimes memory cards fail, they don't save. You wanna make sure that you're checking your memory card while you're shooting, and if you have an extra one, carry it with you. Lens cleaning kits. Um, the amount of people that have sneezed on my camera when I'm trying to take a picture of them. It sounds gross, but it happens. Um, bring a kit, a cleaning kit with you, even a cloth. Don't use your t-shirt though. Uh, a strap of some sort, like I said, you buy a camera, usually you get a strap, unless it's a point and shoot model, they only give you a hand strap. Tripod of some sort, any long exposure. If you can't hold anything straight, get a tripod for yourself. An external hard drive to save all the stuff to it, various filters. You can get polarized UV, um, HGX filters, all this different sorts of stuff. Get yourself additional lenses and, and then lastly, go to classes and workshops. Um, my class is one option. It's a very basic class, class that I offer. Biggest tool that I give is I'll answer any question that you put in front of me. Even if I don't know the answer to it, I'll figure it out. Um, but there are so many workshops, classes. The best practice is just to go out and take photos. Um, Anybody who owns a camera can tell you that. There's no way that you're going to go out and um, take the perfect photo the first time. It takes years to perfect. It takes months. It takes weeks if you got due diligence. Um, but really taking the time and devoting some sort of like work time for yourself to sit and learn something new about your camera on a weekly, daily, monthly, yearly basis will bring you a lot further along in your photo taking journey um, than damage. That's it for me. I put my email and the phone number there. Call me, email me if you guys have specific questions that I didn't answer in this. But like I said, this is the basic class. So we covered kind of a, a wide topic of different things. Um, I'm looking at the chat right now. So please, if anybody has any questions, Liz, the Nikon P1000 is an amazing camera. Uh, if you really want a nice point and shoot model that doesn't involve any interchangeable lenses, I get a lot of people who come in for that for like a Safari. They love the P1000, so it's a great camera from Nikon. Um, yeah, anybody who has any other questions, please chat up. Uh, I'm gonna stay here for as long as I can, and then I'm gonna answer any questions that I got in my uh, in-person class too, so. I have a question. What you got? Is there any like, uh, uh Workflow you can recommend for post. Like, like what? I mean, like, like I, I have Lightroom. Yeah. I, I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> it's a lot, you know. And, and, and I, I went to Lightroom because Photoshop was a little overwhelming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm not as experienced. So like I'm on the flip side of that. I only know how to use Photoshop. I know nothing about Lightroom, and oh. I know that the Lightroom is a simplified version, and it's a little bit easier mm -hmm. to use. Um, I might recommend, it. what I might say is, look at what photos you're taking. Go on YouTube and I would look up people's workshops with it. Mm -hmm. Adobe has been really great. They've been posting a lot of YouTube, uh, videos on their Instagram and on their YouTube of just different artists that they um, have on their like roster that will be like, okay, here's what I'm doing in Lightroom today. I have this photo and I'm gonna try to do this. I wanna manipulate the light or I wanna mm -hmm. change something on here. Um, there's a lot of different stuff that you can do with it. If I'm being honest for myself, unless I really have like a big guff on the photo that just makes me upset, um, I'm mainly changing the hues, the levels, and the saturation of the photo. Mm -hmm. Just going through to make sure things look crisp, look bumped up. Um, if it's one of my like artwork pictures, I'm probably looking at the white balance to see where that's le uh, at. Levels is really great for that because you can basically take um, the darkest tone, the lightest tone, and then the middle tone and you can drag where you want all those to be and you'll see your photo change as you're going. Um, on those Adobe softwares too, what's really nice is like you can toggle between what changes you've made and what the original image looked like. Okay. So I forget what the, what the command button is with that, but you can sit there and basically keep making tweaks and then toggle back and forth to see what your image started off as and what it now looks like to okay. see if what you're doing is good. Okay, great. Last thing you can do too is there's the lasso tool where Let's say you take a beautiful picture of a car and you got way too much shine on the car's hood. 
you can use the lasso tool just to select that part of the image. And basically, like in the old film days, you would uh, burn and dodge an image. Mm -hmm. So when you're doing that, you've got the exposure going on your film, and you've got a piece of paper in front of you, and you basically have like a cloth, mm -hmm. and you're swiping it in front of the thing to change how the exposure is going mm -hmm. on the physical print. Mm -hmm. Digital, totally different. You're just sitting there and changing your commands on there. Um, but that, that's another thing where when you use like the lasso tool on there, you can select a certain area and then let's say the hood is too shiny compared to the rest of it, you can just change just the hood of the car and make that less. Um, that's probably more where you want to be in. Um, Photoshop's great if let's say, you know, I get it's somebody who's like, I want to take these photos and I want to do... Uh, what did they tell me the other day? They had landscape pictures from downtown Chicago, and they're like, I want to make giant cats look like they're swarming the city. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, okay. Uh. And so I literally found a video for them where this guy was taking like fake aliens and making the skies look like nebula in big cities, and then having these like fake aliens look like they were like <laughs> running through the city. Uh, I had another buddy who wanted to put tiny little ant mans on all of his photos to make it look like Ant Man was in the photo, and I was like, that's clever, that's clever. So that's where Photoshop gets a little more advanced. They've got so many tools for just doing that, and then when you do bring something like that into there, you can play with the saturation and the color to make sure that that thing you just photoshopped in there looks like it belongs on that image. So it can be in the same kind of universe, if that makes sense. Do you do similar work workshops for like GoPros and drones? So we're, we're getting ready to discontinue. The last one I just did before this one was for the GoPro action ones. We were going to, I think we're going to get rid of that one. Okay. If you go on the YouTube page, you'll see all the ones I've already done. So just YouTube, App Electronics, you should see all the GoPro action ones I've already done. Um, but I mean, it's not nothing too crazy with those ones. Right. Very basic stuff too. It's hard for us to get into the editing software of stuff because my computers through work have certain restrictions on what programs I can have. And then on top of that, the only ones I have are my personal computer at home that has my Adobe Suites on there and everything else. Um, but the the the. Yeah, I haven't gotten into the specifics on it quite yet. I'd, I'd like to bring it up. They, their plan right now is our media team wants to have me do um, like a quick couple videos on our YouTube page where I just talk about SD cards or I talk about lenses real quick or I talk about some of the more basic stuff um, that kind of gets skipped when I'm teaching these larger classes. Um, but yeah, it's... It's overwhelming. There's a lot of stuff when you first get into it, and finding out what you actually need and what you don't need and what's going to benefit you for the moment. It's. it's I mean, I found out just having a charging wall is something you end up doing because you know it's just a mess of stuff everywhere. So. I oh yeah, my first when I first got it, I my first camera. I remember I had four batteries and I had no charging hub, so I would literally have to keep the camera plugged in, and I would just keep supplementing the batteries in the camera to charge each battery. And then eventually, I got a little stand. Just lock my batteries and it's great. So, with the uh, Photoshop, I so I'm I'm really old school. I've got an old program from years ago from Jask J S C okay. Paint Shop Pro. Yeah, all right. And I've just kept loading it on every new laptop I've gotten. But it's it's I think it's as powerful as Photoshop. Oh, 100. Don't um, ever get rid of that. And it has way more features than I could ever possibly need. But I, I'm doing social media for my daughter's soccer team now, so I'm erasing backgrounds and pictures, and I'm you know, putting people into other pictures and making mm -hmm. graphics and all kinds of stuff like That's that. Cool. But I started looking into the Photoshop, and there's a Photoshop Elements, okay. which you can buy, which is a simpler version of mm -hmm. Photoshop. Okay. And then if you want to do more robust activities, then Photoshop is actually a subscription service now. Right. Yeah. So you continually pay for it. But like you said, you get that cloud service. It's pretty you know, great. Yeah. Yeah. If you utilize it, it's awesome. But don't ever get rid of Jask. Don't ever get rid of that. Because it, it is those old school Photoshop programs function so well. The big difference for them is that the newer Photoshop just has a ton of AI where literally you can say, okay, I want, I just want the, the thing to select the background and it will only take that. And the camera is, or the program, so way back in the day, if you wanted to edit a photo and basically crop something out of it, let's say that, you know, 
you take a picture of the kids and one of the kids is giving somebody the middle finger and you're like, all right, I'm going to get rid of the hand and I'm going to put, you know, whatever in there. Or I'm just going to erase the, the finger. Um, you would take a lasso tool and you would select the whole thing and go. But now it's literally as simple as you just click and it will select the person. You can then double click and it would move down just to the hand and mm -hmm. only select the hand for you. And then you can literally delete and it would just delete the hand. The program is then smart enough to realize what the background is and then fill in the rest of where that hole was. Like it's incredible what the newer stuff can do. Yeah. Yours basically could do all of that. It's just you have to do all that by hand. Yeah. yeah exactly. And so that's like that's the big thing with and the elements I've heard of that. It's a much more simplified one. You don't have the power of the AI, mm -hmm. but you get all the control and manipulation that you're experiencing with yours. And I think they make it now for your like tablet too. I think you can do it on the iPad if you want it. So and it has an online presence, like a website that you can create a login and go to. You can upload your photo, and it gives you access to some of those AIs. Yeah. Um, so if you want to remove the background and just keep the person in the image, mm -hmm. you just click move the background, and it processes it, and then boom, you just have a PNG image with your subject and transparent background that you can now. Oh, wow. The new phone now does that too, the newest iPhone. If I take a picture of something, I can just, I can literally crop out the background without even having to do anything. How do you do that? So, <laughs> so is this the 13? It's the 14. I have 14 oh. Pro. So I, this is a picture of my St. Bernard that I took on my, my camera, right. my Fuji film. I keep the grain as a really high count on there so mm -hmm. it looks a little blurry in certain areas. Now if I want to, if I just select him, all this light went on there, I can then copy. And then let's say I wanted to text somebody this photo. Mm -hmm. So I was gonna send it to grandma. I go paste. It only puts yeah. only him. No background. <laughs> it's only on the 14. I from my understanding, I haven't tried it on the 13 yet. It could work on the Yeah, I have a 13, so give it a shot. It might be in the newest update that just came oh, out. Oh, it might but, be in 16. Yeah, it might be in that 16, but it's crazy what they can do now. And that's what a Photoshop brought into play, I want to say like two or three years ago when they came out with their more advanced AI that can do it automatically for you. But talk about needing all those older skills to sit there and be like, oh yeah, I got this. I know what I'm in here. Is like going? And then you just, this new program does it all for yeah, you. Yeah, it's un exactly. unbelievable. So. Yeah, absolutely. All right. No one else is answering.